Hi, welcome to the Career Refresh Podcast. I'm your host, Jill Griffin. I'm a former media and marketing executive turned career strategist and executive coach. I spent my career working my way up and through the ranks of global organizations and startups, and today I show others how to do the same. Join me each week as we discuss the strategies and actionable steps to leverage your strengths, increase your confidence, and develop your career well-being. Ready? Let's do it. Hi, friends. This is The Career Refresh, and I am your host, Jill Griffin. Today, I welcome David Berkowitz to The Career Refresh. David and I met years ago when we were working on the Coca-Cola business. We were at different agencies, but we shared various parts of our strategic and activation points. And I've always admired David for his curiosity, his thoughtfulness, his intelligence, and his kindness. And as proof to his kindness, he started a free community called Serial Marketer. And yes, it's a play on his name. Serial Marketer is a place where people working in marketing go to get ideas, referrals, build community, connect with community, and even help wanted and post for jobs. Because I know I have been successful in connecting many of my clients with opportunities that have been posted on the Serial Marketer Slack channel. In this episode, we talk about how, as a child, David always had the sense that he was going to do work as he got older that didn't exist yet, that he was going to be in, you know, working in nascent industries with emerging technologies, and he has continually created a path for himself, both as an employee and a freelancer and a business owner, and I really believe that it's due to his insatiable curiosity and his learner spirit. David's unique experiences, right? Starting as a camp counselor, a substitute teacher, a tech writer, a social media and e-commerce expert, video production, and then of course building Serial Marketer has enabled him to hold leadership roles in companies like Media Ocean, Video Production Marketplace Story Hunter, Social Listening Firm Sysamos, Publicis Agency MRY, and then Dentsu 360i. He has contributed to more than 600 columns to outlets such as Advertising Age, Media Post, Venture Beat, and Adweek. A perpetual learner, his journalistic eye has helped many marketers look at trends through the lens of the consumer, and this has propelled him to be a sought-after speaker at over 400 events globally. David really brings this refreshing curiosity to his work. So grab your notes app or a pen, because I'm sure you are going to want to take note of all that David shares. I'm going to put all of his information in the show notes. If you want to join the Serial Marketer community, please do so and mention the career refresh so he has context and knows where you're coming in from. And if you have any questions, as always, email me at hello at jillgriffincoaching.com. Com. Okay, friends, here is to possibility, and I'll see you on the other side. Hey, David, it's so good to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks, Jill. So let's start from the beginning. Take us way back and tell us, um, where did you grow up, first of all? I grew up in Mamaroneck in Westchester County, just north of New York City. Oh, ah, okay. So local New York uh, man. So from there, when you were thinking about yourself as a child, what were some of the things that you thought you wanted to be when you grew up? Well, you know, I, I, there, there have been a few of the predictions that I had that were eerily accurate. And and one of them, and I, I, I think it was you know around like fifth or sixth grade, I was even doing some things like I, having a few of my own early businesses as far as a grade schooler can with things like, well, like actually like helping build computers or write songs. Oh, wow. And so, uh, lyrics unlimited horizon computers. I actually had business cards printed on my, uh, home computer with those. And, uh, I, and I had this sense around then that I would wind up in some kind of job or profession that didn't exist at the time. And That's amazing insight. Yeah, it, it, it was very weird that I could very clearly remember myself thinking that. And, and I was still like, you know, I was not that 
precocious as a kid. I was like on a path to be a teacher or maybe something like, like just a little more um, traditional, right? Uh, uh, and um, or, or at least where there was a set career path for it. And then especially once I later had emerging media in my job title and it hit me, I was like, wow, like I saw this coming. <laughs> Yeah, seriously. All right. So fill in the blanks between, you know, being in fifth or sixth grade, thinking that you were going to do something that hadn't yet been invented and then getting into merging media. Like take us through what were some of those early opportunities post-college? Well, a really big pivot happened my senior year of college and, and I spent eight years as a day camp counselor. I was a substitute teacher uh, at a lot of different grades, like when whenever I was home on break and and you know, there was still a school year going, then uh, it, then yeah, I was uh, like I, I had a great resume for a teacher. I had a terrible resume for someone who would supposedly enter the corporate world at some point. And the the other thing that I was doing a lot of, which might not be so surprising for for those who know me, is that I was writing. I'd been mm. writing like this, especially since I was like five, six years old. I was writing poems. I was writing, uh, I was writing songs. I'd written, you know, I was like the first kid in my grade to write my first book report on a PC and using like an early version of WordPerfect. Wow. And so, so I was you know, carrying all that through and then you know, an editor of the school paper in college and uh, and so I kept doing that and, and then it hit me that maybe there was a way to try making a career as a writer first. And then, yeah, I, and then I could always go back, like, like to me teaching, it, it, it wasn't an easy path by any means. And right. to this date, like most of the hardest work I've done in my life has been, uh, 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 with some of these uh, uh, teaching roles that I had, even in short stints, uh, including as a camp counselor, it's <laughs> they're ridiculously exhausting. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, but at least I knew what that was. I didn't mm. know what a career as a writer was, and so the early idea was maybe I could get paid to write, but not be a journalist mm. because I didn't see myself. Uh, I, I basically had too much respect for journalism then and now to consider myself in that. In sort of the hard news field. part of the business. Okay. Right. And and the internet, This I was graduating in 2000, the, the internet was coming around. I at least appreciated that there was far more of a need for the, for people who could work with the written word. Mm. Now, many more words were <laughs> needed. Than, right. Uh, and so, uh, so I was like, well, maybe there's something there. And, and that got me down this path into the digital media field. Huh. So when you said maybe there's something, did you have a mentor? Were you doing your own research? Like who influenced you into digital media? Well, the, the first person who really got me going there, uh, was, uh, was someone I met at this at this career networking event, not really a job fair that my alma mater, mm-hmm. Binghamton University, put on, and so uh, so so there was like one also just just pivotal event that happened that that led to that meeting, and that was that uh, that in college, a friend and I we were elected co editors in chief of the campus newspaper, which was a really big deal at a uh, ten thousand person you know, university university right and uh but there was so much politics involved in stories that no one here wants to hear um mm. but but so heavy and kind of the stuff that's reminiscent of uh of the reese witherspoon movie election you know with Matt oh, okay Peter. okay yeah. like, like that kind of stupid stuff that would go on okay. uh and and my friend and i would basically just said like take the paper back, like you can have it. But then we needed something to do. And in 1999, I started the campus group that was to create a website that was sort of an alternative to the entertainment section of the school paper. And huh. against all odds, I didn't realize that was actually giving me job skills. And oh, interesting. So it was giving me content creation skills. It was giving me management skills. It was giving me technology skills. 
and I had to. Yeah, I, 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 uh, my webmaster reminded me uh, of the Spinal Tap drummer, so uh, <laughs> I constantly needed to replace them. And so then it was like, wait a sec, we were supposed to publish this thing, and now we have to learn how to do it ourselves. So it was great. Uh, and then when I was talking to this guy at the Metro Career Fair, he worked in publishing. I was just starting to think, hey, maybe I could mm. go and uh, and do something with writing. And he was listening to my background. He said, wait, you have a website? Again, this was 99. This was not something, maybe some of us had GeoCities websites at the time. I had one, um, but not something most people actually did as like a project or a hobby. And he said, he said, you have a website? You should speak to my brother. And his brother ran what was then basically a competitor to TV Guide, but entirely online. Huh. And so as we were, so I talked to his brother and, and his brother never returned my calls or emails, and that's fine, but he got me thinking down that path, and I started to apply for some uh, jobs in digital media, and I got my first one at this terrible, terrible tech startup uh, right after school, at, but I just got to immerse myself in this pretty early on. I wound up with, uh, I wound up getting this job as an editor at eMarketer. And oh, okay. So... So, and, and this was just an incredible place to learn so much about the industry, right? Like, so yeah, it wasn't yeah. just, uh, uh, so, so it wasn't like just any place out there. eMarketer was taking this 30,000 foot view as they still do today. I'm covering everything. And so one day I'd be writing about, uh, about like this nascent field of online grocery shopping and even being one of the first people to tour Fresh Direct's facilities. Mm. And then the next day, I'd be writing some article about Estonian e-commerce, right? Like, like, right. like weird, weird stuff. Right, um, right. And then I started this interview series at eMarketer doing these long-form interviews there where I interviewed 175 different execs and authors and uh, and other influential people in the space and just just... Again, this like kid in a candy shop opportunity to learn because yeah, like I still knew nothing, right? Like I had no training in marketing, right. I, and I just like kind of knew how to put a sentence together and and make other people's sentences uh, sound a little more coherent. Uh, right. Uh, but but all the actual stuff about a, about being a practitioner, I had to learn. Just the the and and I had some great you know, Sylvia, uh, Sylvia Jimenez, uh, Sterell Centeno. I had some incredible people to to learn from there on the job at eMarketer uh but uh but like wow, it just just took a, a lot to do that on the fly and then uh and then while as I was writing uh all, all these pieces and I was writing a lot of them about search engine marketing uh a few years into it um the 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 PR exec at the time Mark Naples who who uh, still runs with strategy. He was working with the Jeff Herza, who was the CEO of iCross, who I just interviewed. Mm. And Mark called me a few weeks after that interview that I ran. He said, Jeff wants to talk to you about a role there. I'm like, mm. really? <laughs> uh, okay. And I'm like, what do I do? And, and Mark was tremendously helpful. Uh, and I got to work with Mark a bit when I got over there. But that shifted me over to the practitioner side. And that directly led to my longest running roles to date, working at another, at the time, search marketing firm, 360i. Right, right. Okay. So if someone was listening to this and wondering, like, wow, you you met these people because you were doing your job, basically, right? You know, writing for eMarketer. But somewhere along the line, those relationships went from, I'm going to say, you know, technical and transactional into mentorship. What do you think you did, whether knowingly or unknowingly? that change those relationships into being a mentorship? Well, you know, I, I think one of the things that I was better at than maybe the average person was that, uh, that I used not just humility, but, but my real like self-awareness of the lack of knowledge I had in the space to my advantage. And that I was, and I like to think still am, there to learn. And so, so 
when I was trying to listen to these people's stories, I, I was trying to figure out what was going on again, because I, I didn't know very much. Right. So, so, so I'd have to also work a little bit harder to try to make sense of this in a way that someone else would understand it too. And so, uh, so that also continued even when I wasn't writing, but when, when I was later at 360i, you know, the reason that I, that some of the closest relationships I have in the industry are with some, uh, with various salespeople. And mm-hmm. also a lot of these PR people is that, is that for the folks who are pitching me, I'd often give them the time of day when other people weren't right? like, mm. I, like I didn't care how many readers the marketer had versus something else. I didn't care how much, uh, like how big a campaign was that 360i was working on for someone else. It was just like, like I just want to hear if this makes sense and what we could do about it. And could I then share this with someone like you to say like, we got to run this by Coke. You know? Right. Right. Uh, right. And, and, and some of this, stuff I was learning about then was like really nuts at the time. Right. Um, but, but I was one of the first people who would actually take that meeting and sit down with them and see, even if I couldn't do anything with it, like I, I'd be able to go and just try to figure it out with them. Right. Right. So what I'm also hearing is in addition to that early vision of I'm going to work in something that doesn't exist before, <laughs> you know, emerging media, you also then within your roles worked in unknown or, or nascent industries in undefined roles and being able to really navigate that gray, right? I mean, you know, I know you work for Sysimos. I know that um, you got publicist at, at the agency MRI, but um, M. R-Y, excuse me, formerly known, people may have known it as Mr. Youth, which was a top, top youth marketing and advertising agency. Obviously, Densu 360i, but you were in undefined roles. How did you navigate being in the gray? Because it can also mean that, you know, goals, performance is a little squishy, but you obviously excelled in that and were able to continue to prove the value of bringing to a role. How did you navigate that? Well, that's uh, that was some of the fun for me, and so <laughs> I, okay. Yeah, so I, uh, some of it is I, I liked having that baseline of zero to run with, and and mm. so yeah, even when I was at companies that were a bit further along, I was typically the first person to have that role, or uh, and I was often coming in at uh at this transitional time where, you know, uh, there, there are just some, some major changes happening with the, uh, with this company. Uh, and then now trying to, you know, trying to build out what the next version of this role looks like, because the, uh, because things were going to be very different. And, and I think, yeah, uh, maybe like for someone like me, who I, I guess likes to, be in positions where I wind up being that outsider, a bit of that Mm -hmm. underdog, right? Like not someone who's trying to create a resume for a certain role. It's just trying to see where I can add value and where I'm really excited by what the, uh, these other people I get to work with are doing and building um, and how they're creating value for their clients. Like, like, can I be part of that in some way? Does that make sense? Uh, But, uh, 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 but all of that has been really appealing for me. And that means that for a lot of these more like cookie cutter opportunities, like I wasn't the right fit for it. Mm-hmm. And so, so it was like, like, we'd have to find each other. Right, right, right. No, and I think that's a really good point, again, for anyone listening that's looking to short, sort of take all the collection of their unique skills and figure out, you know, it is possible to create a job. There are jobs that are absolutely posted. We need a we need a vice president of this or a director of that. But it's also very possible to craft and co-create a job, which I think is what I'm also hearing from you. Yeah, and uh, and even at times like uh, uh, did, I don't really even get to discuss this uh, much. I'm not sure I've talked about this publicly, but when when I went to 360i, I had an opportunity to return to eMarketer in. Um, in a more defined role, and I uh, uh, and so 
Uh, I'd been an eye cross. I had this role with Unicast on the rich media side. Um, and so these, so it was very much like these two paths opening up in front of me at this fork in the road. And so, uh, eMarketer was a great home to me. You hear how fondly I, I, yeah. I, I speak of it. Like, I, I'm still so close with a lot of people who've been there. I knew people who'd worked there for like, uh, worked there for like 20 years. And it's just incredible how they're, it, it, even some people uh, who are there today as part of insider intelligence, like, I, I actually work with them and it's incre- like, I love any opportunity to do anything mm. with them. And I even have a guest byline through media ocean and one of the reports out right now. Uh, right. Um, right. Right. But, but to me, that was also, that was the traveled road. Yeah. And then, and 360, I am like, wow, they're, they're in this very entrepreneurial place. They wanted to hire me in some strategic planning role. And this, relates to other things you've heard today that I didn't know what strategic planning was. I didn't really know what strategy was. I didn't know what any of this stuff was. Um, but I just was, well, you were doing it, but you didn't know what it meant in a formal sense. Yeah. And and there was very much the sense that if Brian Weiner and Sarah Hofstetter, uh, if they wanted to hire me, that they saw something, maybe I didn't, I really liked their vision for where things were going. And I'm like, you know what? Like, Ultimately, it came down to just, uh, am I just going to take this leap and do something that I didn't know if I could do? Uh, right. Uh, and so, uh, so it, it, it was it was by far one of the best decisions I ever made. But I had two great decisions to like like it was, it was a very rare for me to have that can't lose proposition. It was a right. very tough decision to make. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so that makes me think that, you know, you made a decision which was based on probably a mixture of the known and unknown. So how do you find that you tap into mindset and your instinct? Like, how do you hear that voice for yourself? Yeah, there, some, some of it's also like, like when, yeah, uh, for, for a lot of decisions, one, one of the things that I, that I hear from others and it, and it could be a partner or, or a friend or just like a, a mentor. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, it, uh, at, at least for me, and I'd imagine this is, this is true for most people is especially if I'm describing an actual decision, then, then what's been a common thread is someone will say to me, I can tell in your voice what you want. Yeah. Mm. So I often won't admit it, even if I do know what I want, like I won't admit it. I uh, uh, get really nervous about this, but if I can just sound out of it to someone I trust, it then becomes very clear what I get very animated about. And then, oh, and then just think like yeah, something else that like, okay, this would be a good idea, but my heart's probably not all the way into it. Okay. So I would take that to mean that you're, you're a verbal processor in that way, that you want to talk it out with someone that you trust and then it helps you make a decision. Is that a fair readback? It does. It's, it's, it's a very fair readback. And, and, and it is that like, just, uh, just often when I, uh, when I have that hesitation, then, uh, then yeah, like I just, I need some outlet for that emotion to come through and to mm. just, uh, and, and that is going to be the deciding factor. So I want to take a little bit of a pivot. You're a well-known speaker at many industry events throughout, you know, years now you're been a sought after speaker. You've also founded a, uh, marketing community that I definitely want you to dig in and talk about. And you've written, I mean, I think the last count is something like over 600 columns for many of the industry traits. How did you also navigate that? Was that, were you doing that while you were also working and pitching yourself to many of the industry trades and writing opinion pieces? Take us through kind of how that all played out. Yeah. Well, I mean, eMarketer was a great place to start that because I wrote hundreds of uh, articles there. And so uh, I, I realized that that writing was a great way to get to learn about something. Um, when I joined eye crossing, uh, 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 again, you know, this is where, uh, I, I realized several times that, uh, that, that whether it was Mark Naples or, uh, or, 
Amanda Malco, who uh, joined 360i a little bit after me, and, and having great PR and comms people you work with uh, yeah. a very long way. And they're, yeah. and, and having had roles like that myself, it's like, yeah, you know, I appreciate the role treasures. That, that unsung hero. And Mark told me, for instance, that Media Post was just starting this insider series uh, where they where they were looking for guest columnists and specifically they were starting with the search insider uh, and said, I, I would like, like, why don't you go and, and give this a shot and be uh, one of the first columnists, which to me was incredibly daunting, mm. um, but was, but was this great outlet. And very quickly with media posts in particular, what hit me was since I don't have all the experience as a practitioner then I'm going to use my experience as the consumer and end user, and then then work backwards and say, this is so. This is what marketers need to know based on this experience on the ground. But there again, you're you're also threading through the idea, like you said when you first got to e marketer, of being um, humble and not necessarily knowing everything. So coming at everything with a really keen eye for learning, which also then tells me that, you know, this idea of coming to media posts with the eye of the consumer's point of view, it, again, it ties back to that curiosity because you know, as well as I do, that when all of us get together, we are nerding out on concepts that the consumer is like, I don't care right? I just need to know what it's going to do for my life or how is it going to, you know, save me time or be useful to me, right? And we'll often think about some of the other things. So that fresh take on really keeping that consumer voice at the table, I think is probably one of the other reasons why you've been tremendously successful. All right. So let's get into, um, you were an employee, you went out on your own, you became a freelancer. And I think that that is such a rich and important journey for people to understand that there's one is not better than the other. There are different benefits at different times. So take us through some of that experience. I was at a startup and they ran out of money. And so they, I did uh, a bit of consulting and I, and I started setting things up under the serial marketer name that exact time that I was laid off, I started the communities. I'm grateful for a lot of the experience I, I had in terms of just needing to learn how to do everything from scratch, but there was a lot I didn't like. And like for mm. me, the thing I didn't like the most was having to do business development and sales for me. I, I, mm. like, like I could go out and say, uh, say to anyone, like here's why you should work with MRY, I, uh, uh, here's the latest thing from, from Sysimo. It's like, I, I was totally okay hitting up my contacts with that, representing their brand industry events. It was like, I, first of all, I was kind of bored talking about myself. I didn't want to have to do yeah. that. Uh, and, and I really didn't like having to just sell me over and over again. And, and then it's really draining when someone doesn't want to buy you and you were selling mm. you. So yeah. it's hard to separate that. And the part that goes along with it that maybe not everyone uh, appreciates is uh, I, I, I remember there, there, there was one guy I was talking to very early on, uh, Greg Narain at, at some event, uh, goes by Gregarious, as a lot of people know him. And, and, and so, so Greg said to me, you know, you're going to spend about a third of your time uh, 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 doing some version of sales for yourself. A third, of your, a third of your time doing operations, and then a third of the time actually doing the work. And mm -hmm. I was like, that sounds terrible, right? Like I want to spend <laughs> 95% of the time doing the work. Doing the work, yeah. And then I realized that some weeks and months, it was spending five or 10% of the time actually doing the work. Right? Like if mm. I was between clients or something, and then, then uh, I, I was just like in heavy pitch mode. I'm like, like, when do I have the time to actually do what I want to be doing? Uh, and so, uh, uh, so, so that to me was really daunting. And I think I learned to have a, a lot of respect for those who, who stick with it. So for me, I was still just really looking for the right team to be a part of. I, I, I was like, it would have been great if 
I wound up being wildly successful as a consultant and never needed to look for a job again. But like, even still, I still would have wanted to be part of a bigger team. Of a community, sure. And it wasn't quite that easy, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so I was very yeah. happy to go and, 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 and keep an eye out for like, what sort of team was right for me to rejoin and where could I add that value and, and who could I learn from? Yeah. Yeah. No, I can relate to that. And, you know, I'm, I'm independent now five and a half years and I love what I do. I don't exactly have the same percentages that you just mentioned. I get to spend more than half my time, you know, working with people individually or working, you know, going into corporations and doing training work, but there's definitely to your point, you know, promotion that you need to do and content that you need to do to promote the services that you offer. So I definitely um, see that. And I would say too, what I, what I know from most of my entrepreneurial friends is it is there can be a loneliness if, if you're doing it by yourself, or even if you have one other person, there still can be some level of loneliness. So you really have to strive to connect. And that's what I've been able to find is, you know, a few different communities to stay connected to. And one of them is yours. So tell people about the serial marketers community. Well, well, serial marketers, it, it did start in, in the aftermath of, of that downturn that I experienced in, uh, in my own work. And, um, but it was the, the, one of those times where it's like, okay, so what am I going to do now? And I had this idea actually, when I, when I came up with the serial marketer name that was actually using a phrase that, uh, I first heard in 2015 from Aaron Strout, who's a, a brilliant marketer that, that, uh, uh, a lot of folks know, uh, it was W2O net, then real chemistry for, uh, uh, uh it's been there, uh, uh, for a really long time. And, and, and so he introduced me on another blog for some HubSpot event as serial marketer, not killer. Uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> so I loved that. And, and so, uh, so, so I should still probably pay him royalties for, right, for, for the name. But then when I went down that path, I was like, hey, you know, like a lot of people are serial marketers. Everyone talks about being a serial entrepreneur. No one talks about being a serial marketer. If you looked at Google at the time, basically no one was using the phrase. So it's mm. like, like it would be really fun to bring serial marketers together. But then I was like, on the flip side, I started this with a really twisted pun on my own name. Like, like this is dark and weird um, and, and the one thing I didn't want to do was start a vanity project. This couldn't be some mm. friends of David's show and just like, mm -hmm. oh, he's doing this. Cause this is like, like he wants to be at the center of it. I, I, I'm very much in that, you know, Groucho Marx camp of not wanting to join that club that would have you, uh, let alone start the club that, mm. would have you. so uh, but finally I was like, you know what, there are some ways to do things differently. Like I'm part of some of these other groups that I love, but people weren't using Slack this way at the time. It was a good way to organize conversation. Maybe there was a good way to bring some people together who, who weren't even like a part of some of these other groups and actually needed something like this. Uh, and I started with a single LinkedIn post and it's grown from there to now more than 3000 people who are part of this. And, and I'm like, like some days I wake up and I'm like, I can't believe this thing still exists four years later. Uh, Amazing. Uh, and let alone that it's still active and, and that, uh, that I still get to just spend some time doing this and learning from people who are in it and connecting people there. It's, it, it's just this really fun outlet for me. Yeah. So take people through, you know, I've used it a couple of times where, um, my clients, uh, my private executive coaching clients are looking for new opportunities, but they can't necessarily post. So I've been in there networking with people and then making connections that way. So that it keeps the confidentiality with my clients. Um, but there's also great thought leadership. There's meetups, take them through a little bit more about what the serial marketing community offers, because I know people are going to hear this and be like, wait, I want to join. So well, tell them. Well, there there was uh, one of those days during the pandemic where I was actually uh, I, I stayed in Manhattan the whole time, basically, and uh, and I was on the subway one day, and I guess there there weren't a lot of people around to observe, and and maybe I wasn't uh, glued to my phone at the time, and I just started looking 
around at the all, all the ads, which were basically um, even uh, they were basically all uh, direct to consumer e-commerce companies. They were there, and they all kind of looked alike, and all just like like a little kitschy and, and cute, and like I just uh, like like that, uh, just that same degree of snark and like you know wink wink and you know in, in New York Insider. Uh, copywriting and, and it was all very good, just not very differentiated. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just got me thinking down this path. Like, if I had an ad like this for my own community, what would it be? Mm. And that same day, I, I started sketching things out, and and I came up with a tagline that uh, that to me still sums up the community, and that's marketers need marketers too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I mean it both on a transactional level and an emotional level. Yep. And, and so whatever that hook is for you, great. Because sometimes you're in a new role, right? Like, like you need an SEO consultant. You need someone to say, like, uh, uh, which kind of email marketing system is better. You need to start hiring uh, some members of your team uh, 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 who people know who's just great, who, who you can just get some personal uh, recommendations for. But sometimes it's just, you know, we just like need to know that there are peers out there going through these things. Like we feel disconnected. And and the number one reason people are joining is when there is this, this need state. I need a job. I need to hire someone. I need a recommendation. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, there, there, there's something that, that I want right now. And the wanted channel in the community is... It is by far one of the most popular. Right, uh, and then from rich. there, it's like, okay, well, you know, can I contribute to others' posts? Like, can I connect with some people? And and people are doing business with each other all the time. I'm often hearing yep. well after the fact. People are uh, people have gotten jobs and and great candidates through there, and a ton of people have got gigs. And like, I mean, there's the, the, uh, uh, a friend of mine I made through the com- community, Zach Rosga at. Uh, at Thies, this great in-game advertising company, he credits the community for being this lifeline to it. I think that's the exact word he, he's used. Yeah. Uh, uh, and especially during a time when he couldn't necessarily get out there as much. And so it's like, I see that level. I'm like, I, wow, like this is working. And, and how do I just facilitate more of that? All right. So David, this has been fun. Tell everyone where they can follow you, uh, where they can find out more about Serial Marketer. Tell them everything. Uh, yeah, sure thing. Well, uh, I'm D Berkowitz on most channels and you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, and the like. Uh, the community is at SerialMarketers.net. And so there's a you know, join today button form. Uh, if you ask uh, where someone heard about it, definitely uh, yeah, I definitely mentioned this show. So I have a little bit of context and can get you right in there. And it's always good to know how people hear about this, right? No, yeah. No, number one thing you see on every kind of marketing form. Uh, and, and, uh, so yeah, it's just, just the, uh, more that, uh, that I can play at least some small role in, in connecting people with, uh, other great, uh, companies, other great people than, uh, uh, that, that also, you know, beyond the, the day job that, uh, that I get to do, it's like, I could all just, uh, you know, comes together and, um, uh, yeah, happy to hear what's, uh, on your audience's minds. That's great. That's great. So I'll also put everything in the show notes so people can follow those various links. David, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking everyone through your journey and sharing your knowledge, especially the unexpected wins along the way, the unexpected strengths along the way, and how really all of these different experiences, you're collecting them, and it's really continuing to show up and pay off in your current role. So I think that's really important for people to hear that there's no wasted experience. It's all being used. So thank you. Well, thanks for having me as part of this incredible series. It's great to be here, Jill. Thanks for listening to the Career Refresh Podcast. If you're enjoying this and you want more information, go to my website, jillgriffincoaching.com. There you can find information on how to work with me one-on-one or my group programs, or even bring me into your workplace. I'll put the link to my website in the show notes. But hey, listen, before you go, do me a favor, rate and review this podcast because it definitely helps me get the word out to people everywhere so that they can also thrive 
in the workplace. All right, friends, I appreciate you. I'll see you soon.